Well, welcome back. After a uh, wonderful lunch and a terrific, terrific talk, uh, I'm going to go out and buy any biography of Charles Carroll of Carrollton I can get my hands on now. Just wonderful. Well, we, we still have, a, it's sort of like television ads that say, but wait, there's more. And we have a couple more speakers. The first, uh, I am very pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Gleaves Whitney. Gleaves became director of the Grand Valley Center, of the Grand Valley State University's Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies in 2003. Prior to his arrival at GVSU, Gleaves worked for 11 years in the Michigan gubernatorial administration of John Engler, ser serving as uh, senior speechwriter, chief speechwriter, and historian. In his uh, seven short years of running the Howenstein Center, Gleaves has elevated its activities into national and even international prominence. More than 275 Howenstein programs have thanks to coverage by C-SPAN and webcasting, reached hundreds of thousands of viewers on all six inhabited continents. And I suspect a few penguins in Antarctica as well. Gleaves has created the first presidential Q&A column on the uh, Hauenstein website called, what else could it be called, Ask Gleaves. Good thing his name isn't Google or it would be a little tougher. He also established a leadership academy for students and young professionals committed to public service. In addition to his public work, Gleaves is an outstanding scholar who writes and lectures nationally on a variety of historical topics. He is the author or editor of 14 books, including, most recently, with Mark Rosell, Testing the Limits, George W. Bush and the Imperial Presidency. The only downside is that we have to share Gleaves with a, a couple of other organizations. Um, he's at the Center for the American Idea, where he's a senior scholar, and also the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal, where he is a senior fellow. On a personal level, and then Gleaves will actually let you talk, uh, he is a terrific teacher. And I can uh, only echo this being a presidential seminar what President James A. Garfield said of his favorite professor at Williams College. Give me a log hut with only a simple bench, Mark Hopkins on one end and I on the other, and you may have all the buildings, apparatus, and libraries without him. Such is the value of a true teacher. Gleaves will be presenting the closing keynote address Adam Smith and American Generosity. I give you Gleaves Whitney. Some days it is like just talking to a log <laughs> when you're teaching. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joel, for that very gracious introduction. Uh, I am just thrilled uh, to join you and so many distinguished people today. Usually the last person to speak at such a high powered conference is tempted to despair because all the good things have already been said. In this case, um, I'm the penultimate speaker. Um, but that hasn't stopped many a fool from grabbing a microphone at the end of the day. I'd be foolish if uh, I didn't have so many good colleagues who helped bring this conference off. It would be foolish not to acknowledge them at this point. So let me just take a minute to say Thank you to all who have participated to make this conference an outstanding intellectual event, cultural event, a success. I want to thank the speakers. I want to thank Brad Berzer for an outstanding talk over lunch. I want to thank the leadership at the Johnson Center, certainly Joel and Kathy, and going back to Russ Mobby, uh, Dorothy Johnson. I want to thank Ru uh, Ralph Hallenstein uh, for making our center possible through his generosity and his vision. And I want to thank the staff of the Hallenstein Center. Uh, we've got uh, Mandy and Brian and Kathy and, and Adam and all the people who make this place work. And um, it's just been a, a great event. I think when we first talked about having such a conference, we couldn't have imagined how good it would actually be pulled off, how well it would be pulled off. Well, 
We've explored the roots of uh, American philanthropy that presidents and first ladies would draw upon. And we've looked at uh, some of the people, last night Ben Franklin, we've looked at uh, George Washington, of course Martha Washington right there by his side. Uh, great, great philanthropists when you consider what they gave in the revolutionary effort. We've looked at the institutions of civil society, what Burke called the little platoons, what uh, de Tocqueville uh, described as voluntary associations, the glory of Amer the American Republic, really. Uh, we could also mention all the volunteerism and, and the frontier. You've, you've heard about how people kept getting pushed west, and before government institutions could be established there, people had to rely on their own lights, their own efforts to get things done. Military engagements have contributed mightily to philanthropy because of the sacrifice of families to send soldiers abroad. Periodic Great Awakenings have leavened many of our civic opportunities. And then there have been panics, depressions, recessions that have also been crucial to understanding the growth of American philanthropy when so many of our citizens have been in need and people have stepped up to the plate to respond to those needs. Court cases, a number of court cases have established a framework in which philanthropy could take place. That's, that's awfully important too, and perhaps an area where there could be some interesting research. And of course, even the way we think of the market economy, there's been a lot of tension today about the market economy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, philanthropy. But even the way we think of the market economy has been a wellspring of philanthropy. And I love the way Russ Mobby teaches about this. Russ will come into a room, this is the first thing he did with our leadership fellows. He said, you know, our system has the market economy, think of it as a big circle in the Venn diagrams. And then you have the government sector, which taps into the wealth of the market economy for its revenue. And then you have the philanthropic sector that relies on the profits generated in the market. But the market has got to go to make all the engines work. Now I'd like to spend a few minutes speaking about these three sectors as they appear in the work of all people, and this may surprise you, the work of Adam Smith. I choose Adam Smith because his writing provides crucial, if often overlooked, insights into American philanthropy. As we talk about our national story to one another, we should never forget that from the beginning, Smith's work has been an important backdrop to the policy making of US presidents. And even when a president has disagreed with much of what Smith wrote, say in The Wealth of Nations, that president would have to deal with the moral philosopher because his influence has been so great. So I'm not saying you have to agree or disagree with Adam Smith. What I am saying is to understand philanthropy in the context in which it is unfolded, we need to grapple with Adam Smith. It may surprise you to learn that our current president is quite the fan of Adam Smith. Uh, he's a very close reader of him. In October 2008, the New York Times asked all the presidential candidates what the, um, or, I'm sorry, by then uh, we knew it would be Barack Obama, asked him to provide a list of his favorite authors and books. President, or then candidate uh, Barack Obama, uh, Obama responded with 19 authors whom he regarded as important to his intellectual formation. The one author he listed, where he listed two books by that author, Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations and Theory of Moral Sentiments, more about which in a few minutes. Speaking about Adam Smith also makes me think of the famous debate between two people. You had a Jeffersonian and you had somebody who uh, was an apostle of Adam Smith there in Washington. They're right there by the uh, Jefferson uh, Memorial, the monument there, the Tidal Basin. And uh, the Jeffersonian says, why do you think that Adam Smith was so influential in our country? We have this big, beautiful uh, monument to Thomas Jefferson. That proves that Jefferson's been more influential in the American consciousness. And the guy who so admired Adam Smith said, au contraire, there is an even greater monument to Adam Smith than this beautiful one here. It's the economic heart of the world. It's called New York City. Just kind of an interesting insight. P.J. O'Rourke, who I believe was here last night in Grand Rapids, goes so far as to suggest that Adam Smith is America's founding Dutch uncle. Smith's most famous book, An Inquiry into the Wealth, to the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, makes mention of America more than 100 times. 
The book would serve as a veritable handbook for Alexander Hamilton, when as the nation's first treasury secretary, he helped set up America's economic infrastructure, the premises of long lines that uh, guide us to this day. Now, allow me to provide some context of Adam Smith's work, not in the 18th century when he lived, but in the 17th century. In that early modern era, when free market ideas were just beginning to sprout, capitalism was justified by recourse to providence, usually with a capital P. And 100 uh, years before Adam Smith was explaining how market economies account for the wealth of nations, a Frenchman named Jacques Savary, writing in a more religious age, defended markets as the providential mechanism that ensured that humans would be dependent on one another. And I'd like to quote a little passage from Savary's work. By the manner in which divine providence has dispersed things throughout the world, it is clear that God wished to create unity and love among all people because he imposed on them the state of always having need of one another. He did not choose to permit necessities of existence to be found in one place, but rather spread out the gifts in order that men might have to trade together and not just trade, but come to each other's aid as well. Now you can see where this is going. Such references to providence and divine intent were frequent in the 17th century, but they become increasingly rare in the 18th century. That's because in the 100 years between Savary and Smith, the Western mind undergoes a major transformation that historians call the Enlightenment. Western civilization was shocked by a series of religious wars. In some cases, in countries like Germany, wars that wiped out a third of the population. And it was also rocked by science and the new philosophies of Descartes, Hobbes, and Locke. Increasingly, thinkers took up the challenge of explaining human behavior not in terms of God, God's providence, but in terms of strictly human agency. How can you explain human behavior looking just at humans? And onto this increasingly secular stage stepped Adam Smith. He was a brilliant theist and philosopher himself in Scotland. Uh, he was a professor of moral philosophy, and he took up the challenge of explaining why people help one another through self-interest and compulsion and altruism, all three motives. Why? His work, taken as a whole, shows how all three sectors, market, government, and civil society, work together to better the human condition. Now, is this a version of Adam Smith you've not heard before? Smith regards all three sectors, not just the market. Government and civil society are also necessary to better the human condition. Now, this does, as I say, it surprises many people. It's because Adam Smith's thought has been grossly distorted and oversimplified at the cocktail parties. So much of what we think we know about Smith ain't so, and so much that is not well known should become better known. It's time we move beyond the cliches and acknowledge that Adam Smith was no libertarian. I know that's going to shock some people out here. Adam Smith was not a libertarian, and he certainly didn't wear an Adam Smith necktie. So what are a few of the misconceptions? Let's get those out of the way right now. Smith is supposed to be a friend of capitalism. True enough. But in truth, he was never the defender of unscrupulous capitalists. Smith is supposed to be the apologist for self-interest, but in truth, he wrote against the vice of greed and petty self-interest. He only defended self-interest, so rightly understood in an enlightenment sense, he was a man of the enlightenment, self-interest that it was exercised in an ethical framework, informed by the West's spiritual inheritance and Greco-Roman moral earnestness. Smith is supposed to be anti-government. Nothing could be further from the truth. In truth, he was a government bureaucrat himself. After he wrote The Wealth of Nations, he was a customs official. For most of his adult life, in his writings, he mounted a vigorous defense of the necessity of strong government if the market was to work properly. Again, are you surprised by this? Let's now briefly look at how the market was supposed to lead to the betterment of the human condition. We're going to go through all three of these areas very briefly. 
For this summary, by the way, I'm indebted to uh, Jerry Mueller's excellent scholarship on uh, Adam Smith. He teaches at Catholic University of America, where he's a historian, a professor there. To Smith, the goal of the market economy was to raise the standard of living for more and more people over time. And in The Wealth of Nations, he explained how competition in the marketplace channels self-interest into socially beneficial goods and services. He famously showed how such simple products as wool coats and hat pins could be manufactured in greater quantities and cheaper prices so that just about everyone could afford them. The metaphor he uses to explain this institutional arrangement that channels self-interest into socially desirable goods and services is, of course, what you all have heard, the invisible hand. That's, in essence, what books one through four of The Wealth of Nations are about. This invisible hand that, through institutional arrangements, channels our selfishness, channels it into useful commodities. But Smith knew that the invisible hand could often become an invisible foot. And that is why you have to read beyond book four of The Wealth of Nations. You've got to tackle book five of The Wealth of Nations to get a fuller picture of Adam Smith's thought. To understand how it was not just the marketplace that would produce betterment, but also government. And by extension, we'll show in a few minutes, also civil society. Read Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations and another work Smith authored called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and you'll get this fuller picture that I'm arguing for. Let's look at government and Smith now that we've already treated the market. He comes as a surprise to many, but Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations is devoted to the role of a strong government that should play a major part in the life of a nation because it helps temper the vices of the marketplace. Somehow, many of my libertarian friends never get around to reading book five. They stop with book four. But if they read book five, they will see this fuller picture. What Smith recognizes is that a strong government needs support through reliable revenues. And to him, there is no better way to generate reliable revenue than through a free market economy that is generating national wealth. It certainly beats the mercantilist policies pursued by most European sovereigns at that time. The mercantilist notion of expanding wealth, remember wealth to them was just a static pie. So if you have a nation with this much of the pie, the wealth, and the world's resources, the only way to expand it is through really vindictive policies or war. And this is why there were so many wars uh, in the mercantilist period. Uh, England and France alone fought the first four world wars in human history over mercantile policy. Smith knew this history. He rejected it. He thought that mercantilism was ultimately self-defeating. He championed free trade as a better way for humans to provide for each other's needs. Now, free trade could only prosper in a world of strong nation states. Smith makes this point again and again in robust governments made good trade agreements, they provided for the common defense, they administered justice, they helped build up a people's transportation and communication infrastructures. Lots of roles for government, important roles. Smith also observed that the marketplace could be brutal to workers. He was writing in the opening act of the Industrial Revolution, and he said that there were glaring instances that the division of labor had dehumanized the workplace, and in the factory, as he put it, this is language from the 18th century, men were losing their manly virtues. In response, Smith advocated universal public education paid for mostly at government expense. Yes, Adam Smith. He knew that children, while only 25% of our population are 100% of our future, and we better provide adequately. Modern nation states could not shirk the obligation to invest in children. Okay, we've looked at we've looked at the marketplace, we've looked at government. What about civil society, this third area that Russ Mobby talks about? In Smith's view, even a strong government could not always effectively compensate fully for the dehumanizing vices in the marketplace. And to get a full account of his moral philosophy, you must read the 1759 work, Theory of Moral Sentiments. The work was prompted by the writing of another philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. 
it is, Smith's work is devoted to giving a rather secular explanation, actually, a social scientific understanding of how people become moral beings. In the very first sentence, Smith asserts, I'm going to quote three moral sentiments. No matter how selfish we suppose men to be, there is obviously something in their nature that makes them interested in the fortunes of others and makes their happiness necessary to him, even if he derives, even if men derive nothing from it other than the pleasure of seeing it. Close quotation. In Moral Sentiments, Smith demonstrates that most of us are moved by altruistic impulses, what he calls benevolence. But he recognized that it is a limited impulse in many humans. It's limited by our contacts with other people. We, we tend, Smith said, to feel more charity, more benevolence, more altruism with those with whom we have a relationship. People in our family, our, our friends, our acquaintances that we have a concern for. And in the development of civilization, Smith saw institutions develop in civil society that bettered the condition of people uh, left behind by the marketplace or for whatever reason of government institutions were not assisting. Last night we heard about a whole slew of these institutions. For example, in Franklin's Philadelphia, huntos, hospitals, colleges, lending libraries, volunteer fire departments. Smith did not live to see the birth of modern public relations but he surely would have appreciated the way philanthropic organizations have used the various mass media to form that connection, to broaden it. So you can see a TV commercial, for example, of children in Africa, earthquake victims in Haiti, tsunami victims in the Indian Ocean, and you can form an attachment and voluntarily be moved to give. To sum up, we see that Adam Smith devoted his life work to articulating the different ways the human condition can be bettered. He saw a role for a free market in which self-interest is intelligently channeled into social benefits, for a strong government in a world of independent nation states, and for a robust civil society that taps the altruism, that benevolence, that impulse we have to help others. Each sector has its critical role to play. You can't take any one of the legs out of this three-legged stool and expect a nation to keep standing. And our best presidents have fully understood and acted on that. Thank you. We are running... Can I take a question or two? No, a question. We're running a little short on time. But if there's a question out there, entertain it. Well, Joel, I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, we do have a question in the back. Mr. Flanagan. I was just going to ask to talk about the mass media um, giving us images from abroad that people are not as attached to and generating sort of that, that impulse to give. Uh, what role the presidents play in doing? There is where presidents have something similar. I, I think we have some great presidents. First of all, you have TR, Theodore Roosevelt, who recognizes the uh, bully pulpit, and bully in that sense does not mean in the sense that we use bully to, to harangue people or to intimidate them. Bully means a, a jolly good pulpit in that sense. Uh, the rhetorical presidency has developed through the 20th century apace with uh, new media inventions. So in the early 1920s, the radio comes along and you have several presidents culminating in Roosevelt in that phase of our media development master the use of the latest media technology. And then, of course, TV comes along in the 40s and 50s, and John F. Kennedy does such a great job, I think, helping to sell his policies and Peace Corps among them uh, through the use of uh, mastery of TV. Reagan, of course, mastered TV. And then in the 1990s, the age of the internet and all the possibilities that has spawned. So now you can go to you know, whitehouse.gov and you can learn, citizens can learn a very, very a flash, and there, you got all this sophisticated technology which package uh, the president's message very well. The philanthropic message has been very well packaged indeed. If you go to President Obama's WhiteHouse.gov site, uh, if you looked at Clinton's, 
you look at George W. Bush's and a thousand points of light prior to that, where the internet is just, just beginning to take off, you see attempts to, to master the new media to make, to, to, to close the sale with uh, the citizens uh, and emphasizing what Dr. Berzer talked about. Emphasizing that we have to take responsibility to, and we have to feel that we're a part of something bigger and not just evolve into self-interest. And um, I, I think the presidents will continue to play a critical role in that prospect.